So this is our first webinar series for the Multimodal Mass Community, and uh, we call it Multimodal Weekly. Um, our plan is to meet every Friday at 1.30 p.m. Uh, PST. I want to make it regular cadence for folks together uh, to discuss on um, this topic um, at the newest research uh, areas in multimodal AI, um, innovative multimodal applications in different verticals. Um, you know, for people who are building interesting projects related to multimodal or video, they can like, they can you know share them with with community members. Um, or you know, um, building infrastructure technology is also very important. Um, and um, at some uh, events session, um, our team member from Toy Ops will also uh, present the tutorials and guide on how to use our product. So for the first session, uh, here is a brief agenda. Um, we'll have Brian Montage talk about multimodal search in video editing. We'll have uh, Fabio Caroni um, talk about uh, breaking free from the cloud distributed collaborative video encoding. And then I will possibly talk a little bit about um, kind of the past, present, and future of multimodal video understanding. So as you can see, we have a uh, wide ranging uh, you know, diverse topic from the more editors to, you know, the encoding stuff to the more AI yeah, resource side of things. Hopefully that can um, provide a good angle of how this industry is moving. Um, and this is a quick logistic on um, the format. You know, as the presenters uh, finish presenting, um, you know, the talk, the, the next speaker is going to join. So if you have any question, uh, you can send them via the Zoom chat and then each presenters will answer them. Um, um, asynchronously, and then we'll, we'll reserve abruptly about five to 10 minutes at the end, at the top of the hour for a, a short q &A session where, you know, um, you can ask a real time question as needed. Yeah. So with that, I think I'll let uh, Ryan, our first speaker to start preparing for his talk. Thanks. Uh, so yeah, thanks so much, James. Okay, I'm going to share my screen here. Okay, so can everybody see this? Okay. Yep. Okay, thanks. All right, I'll try not to ramble here. I'll try to get through this 15 minutes. Clock starting now. Uh, my name is Ryan Monteith, and I am a factual, unscripted picture editor. And uh, I've been editing unscripted uh, reality, reality competition and documentary programming here in, uh, I'm located in Toronto, Canada, uh, and I've been doing this for the past 20 years. So these are some of the shows that I've worked on. Um, and the common thing between all of these shows, and if you can see there's some Netflix stuff, there's some you know, mainly Canadian content, but Top Chef you might be familiar with, Master Chef and show, shows like that. Um, one thing that's uh, common between all of these shows is that they're they're all unscripted and they're shot with a general plan, but there's no script, meaning that uh, these shows, they come together in the edit suite. So uh, the editor is responsible for, you know, taking, finding the footage and, you know, manipulating that into the story and, and uh, you know, making compelling content. And uh, what I'm hoping to take, you know, for everybody to take away from this today is the thing that makes multimodal search particularly relevant in unscripted editing is the fact that unscripted editors are dealing with potentially thousands of hours of footage. And this is, comes from different cameras and, you know, maybe shooting different people. So you can multiply, uh, you know, the cameras by X amount of hours and it leads to a, a large volume of, of, of media. And um, those that media is then crafted into the story in the edit, which so, you know, ultimately search becomes extremely important. And, you know, just a little bit of background, how I discovered 12 labs is, you know, I was, you know, AI has become a bit more focused in, uh, you know, in general. And I was, you know, searching for how, how like, is there anything out there that can help me edit and help me find, you know, edit better. And in, in that search, I discovered 12 labs and I, uh, you know, shared that with my friend and partner, Nolan Dubo, who's on the uh, viewing today. And uh, we've been on a whirlwind of learning uh, since then. And uh, much of that has been exploring the, the, the 12 labs and multimodal and then all the things that go along with it. So today I'm gonna quickly talk about multimodal search and how it can benefit the video editing process. Uh, 
of the future by relaying some challenges in the current editing workflow, how multimodal search can solve those challenges, and I'm also going to present a basic demo, a uh, very basic demo that we uh, put together that, you know, I see how, you know, search could be used to find clips within the editing realm in the edit suite. And I'm going to conclude with my thoughts on how this technology could be developed for use in the not so distant future. All right, so the search challenges. Um, so I'm not going to read through this necessarily, you know, kind of read through that, but I'm going to speak more from, uh, I want to just let, you know, declare to, on the perspective of an unscripted editor who uses Avid Media Composer specifically. So Avid is a nonlinear edit system and it's the, the main choice for professional editors and production houses that hire professional editors. And Avid Media Composer has been around since 1987 and it's a, uh, something that I've used for the last 20 years of my career. So the thing that I realized when I discovered multimodal search uh, capabilities, you know, in 12 labs in particular was how deprived uh, we unscripted editors have been when it comes to search tools within Avid specifically, um, because that current process requires a person to watch all the footage, manually add metadata such as names, locations, shot types, or any other specific thing that they'd like to label in order to find that shot later on uh, when needed. So again, no, no imagine doing that for hundreds of hours of footage, you know, you're manually tagging these things. And after the first hour, your eyes glaze over after, you know, then your hands start cramping and it's a lot of work. And uh, in, in the unscripted realm that I work in, uh, for that reason, it, it often goes undone. So it's not included either, you know, by means of, you know, they just there's other more important things to do. And that's left to the you know editors to basically watch everything themselves, uh, make their own notes, and you know maybe there's notes from set. And um, fortunately, because of our profession, you know we are we're there because we're good at retaining information. So and then recalling it later on. So the so solutions um, with multi multimodal search as a solution now. That sort of you know relates to the challenges in uh, you know efficiency uh, with the multimodal machine learning models. The analysis of footage can substantially reduce the time required to sort through the footage. So this automation can assist the editor to find, organize, and edit the, the footage more quickly. It's also scalable. You know, multimodal model doesn't get tired, overwhelmed. Your hand, you know, its hands don't cramp. It's uh, you know, it has all the energy in the world. So the processing time can be significantly lower than manual methods, and uh, which allows for greater scalability. And then, as far as precision, you know, most people watching this would know what a multimodal uh, model is. But for those who don't, the algorithms are designed to analyze both audio and video, and, and it does that by um, transcribing. And transcription's been a big talking point in editing as a as a uh, NAB, uh, NAB, there's a lot of presentations that focused on text-based editing and that uh, transcription, auto, automated transcription wasn't really uh, a topic of uh, within my field until I would say this year. Uh, the show I'm working on currently now suddenly is transcribing everything and that's making our jobs a bit easier. But this multimodal technology it would ultimately allow us to search for objects, actions, emotions, you know, different sounds. And, you know, the Bubble Labs uh, API does all that. And not only that, but semantic search comes into play where, you know, you can search contextual searching. Um, with that, I would like to present the demo portion. Um, so this demo was created by, uh, by myself and I, I put it together. I'm not a developer, I'm an editor. And I was able to, through the uh, Total Labs API tutorial that Ankit put together, which was pretty awesome. And there's more than uh, more than one now. I haven't had time to explore those yet, but I really look forward to, uh, particularly the, the, you know, having multiple, um, the one with multiple video files in the, in the folder and it automatically sort of indexes based on recognition of new files. 
the first tutorial, uh, he encouraged people to expand on it. So what I did was I uh, added a search in, uh, input, and I've this is the code, uh, the, the existing code, and then additional. And if anybody wants this, just uh, DM me. I can send it to you, or I can send it to Ankit, and uh, he can distribute whatever. But um, that has resulted in ultimately uh, this as the um, basic demo that I put together. And what's interesting is the the variety of search queries that you can perform, uh, which would be relative to editing, is that you know let I've got four that I want to share with you. So we'll go through them quickly. Um, so the first one is people on mountain bikes. So this is like a visual search, right? So I'm using a show that I've worked on in the past. And uh, thanks to everybody that has uh, allowed me to use this. Um, so, so it's finding these clips of people on Netflix. And that's a that would be an object search. So it does a really good job of that that particular search query. The next query I want to show is wide shot of uh, a lake. So Excited to say that this works. So that's, uh, again, pretty cool. Uh, let's say people, let's get a little bit richer, singing inside, or sorry, out, outside. It's a search query. So this is pretty cool because it's understanding that context of somebody So they're outside, they're singing, that, that, that's pretty cool, you know? Um, and then the last one that I found was really interesting, it's very contextual, is people strategizing. Okay, so. Do you have a preset? Uh... Confidence score set here that you use? I don't have the confidence score programmed in, but it's something that I definitely want to include for the next one. Uh, for when I do revise it, it's definitely something that I've thought about. But the confidence score is included in the JSON data. Where um, are you pulling these clips from? I don't quite understand what your source is. So this is my, I, I've uploaded this from uh, local. So I've locally uploaded this based on the tutorial that shows you how to local uh, upload from a local source, index it, and then it's it, it lives in a static folder. So then it's uh, it can draw from the, the JSON file, then sort of uh, is code draws the file from my local drive, the drive that I've set it to for the, uh, so the, the path. The video that you are searching, it's so essentially the same video you are searching and based on the query you are giving, like it's showing the result in different points of time, right? So Correct. that input video is basically, you, you have that manually inside your code. It's not like, okay, I see. Yeah, I, I've, I've uploaded, indexed it through this 12 labs. So it's drawing from 12 labs, it's the JSON data that's been created. And then that is then the HTML and the, the it's a Flask application. Sorry, it's a one it's a Flask app that's programmed to draw from the ins and outs. It finds and it sources the ins and outs. It, it, it's pretty cool, honestly. This is like this is next level for you know what I do as far as a video editor and the, the applications that, that I have at my my you know ability to to edit together a show. Um, you know, with that, uh, I know I'm coming up on my 15. 
and I'd love to answer more questions later. Uh, but the conclusion is, uh, in conclusion, I would have to say that, you know, this technology uh, isn't currently being used in editing, and it's something that sounds like a no brainer. It's and I, I, I have great belief that this will be implemented in in the you know, future iterations of nonlinear edit systems. If not, uh, you know, I think it's a bigger project than anticipated when, you know, first sort of starting out here and it's something that, you know, Definitely, uh, I'd like to explore. It's uh, one thing about unscripted editing is the challenge. It, you know, people say, "Oh, it's a, quite a challenge to develop a piece of software." And it's like I, I work in, in unscripted editing and uh, TV shows that it's a challenge every day. I'm, I'm up for it. So, um, you know, I'll leave it with this. Like, uh, you know, this uh, there's some great quotes about automation, and uh, you know, automation is not about limiting jobs. It's about eliminating routine tasks and creating more opportunities for people to do creative, meaningful work. And, and I believe that is a uh, is something that can be uh, taken for anybody that's doing creative work uh, can sort of reduce the uh, tedious tasks. You have more time for that creative, which is which is great. It's something that I'm going to you know stand behind, and and uh, that that's what I want to sort of see moving forward. So if uh, yeah, if anybody wants to connect, uh, my uh, socials are there. And uh, thanks so much for having me, uh, Soyoung and James and Ankit and uh, the other Ryan and everybody else that's uh, <laughs> that's yeah. part of Twelve Labs. So thanks so much. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, appreciate you standing us up. And uh, the, I think there's a couple of questions in the chat as well. You want to answer them um, asynchronously. Uh, in the meantime, thanks. Yeah, good luck to. Uh, get Fabio to start you know, sharing the screen and uh, talk about uh, distributed video encoding. First, thanks so much. Let me share the screen and confirm you can see it. Yep. All right, thanks so much, uh, James, So Young, and everybody at 12 Labs for having me. Uh, my name is Fabio, I'm the founder of Byte Night. And today I'll be talking about breaking free from the cloud, video encoding powered by distributed and collaborative computing. So this topic is uh, maybe just uh, touching uh, multimodal AI slightly, but it is of great importance as video is becoming an essential part of our lives and managing video is also very, very important. I would start by saying that, um, as you may know already, 80% of the internet is video today. And um, we're talking about uh, 82% of all internet traffic uh, that is video by 2022, as Cisco said, and also like 85% of all internet users in the United States watch online video content every month on their devices. And that's not all. Uh, there's another 80 in this uh, statistics. 86% uh, of marketing professionals uh, reported that they use video as a marketing tool. So really, uh, there is so much video on the internet. The question is, how can we improve online video? And um, how can we make it better for the internet users and lighter and easier for the providers? What are the areas where human technology can be expanded to enhance the delivery and consumption of video uh, over the internet? So I've tried mm -hmm. to provide some answers for you. Uh, definitely uh, we've come a long way since the first versions of digital television, television and MPEG 2. Uh, we have witnessed, you know, the rise of over-the-top streaming services, the growth of live streaming, um, especially on social media platforms, and recently the rise of artificial intelligence and in video production and management. And Twelve Labs uh, has something to say on this. Um, but from a tech tech perspective, there are several aspects of video that are currently under the radar, and um, yeah, I tried to sum them up, especially. Uh, from the takeaways of uh, the NAP 2023, where my company exhibited. And yeah, it sounds like um, on the software engineer side, um, you know, low latency protocols like WebRTC, the successor of low latency HLS, is, um, is taking hold um, and is used to deliver near simultaneous exchange of data. Then we have uh, newer and efficient codecs that can improve the compression and the quality of online video at its DNA. So we're talking about, you know, 30% increase in efficiency, for example, with LCVC. 
Uh, we have we have AI, of course, for dynamic content creation and a disparate range of um, industries. And these uh, companies can leverage AI for some starting projects, for scaling content creation, for generating personalized advertising on the fly. And um, on the second one, the content exploration and understanding, of course, um, this is what the webinar is about. And I'll let Ch uh, James chime in later and share the view on multimodal AI for video understanding. Um, and also we have network improvements. We have a multi-CDN approach um, coming up and uh, a lot of improvements in connectivity tech. So of course, 5G, ATSC 3.0 is a digital broadcast model that supports high dynamic range digital streaming everywhere in the US and 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 the most modern uh, Starlink uh, with, uh, you can watch your favorite Netflix series uh, while driving an RV across the country. So of course there are a lot of um, improvements and advancements in, in online video uh, delivery. But there's a core element in video that could undermine all these fancy advancements if not faced with the same innovative approach. And I don't want to break it to you, but video is just a collection of data and it's a lot of data. And I, by that, I mean thousands of terabytes uploaded to the internet every hour. Uh, because even before you read, you try to read or understand video, you need to store it and prepare it somewhere. So uh, taking a step back into the video management workflow, I've asked myself, how do companies today compress, store, and deliver video? And uh, of course, um, the answer is the cloud. <laughs> the cloud has been prized by video companies for its scalability, reliability, you know, cost effectiveness, security. But today, video is pervading every aspect of our lives, and it seems overstated to lean exclusively on a handful of big tech cloud providers to manage all the world's media assets. So um, I've run some research on AWS to see how convenient managing a big video workflow in the cloud is. And I've used um, Media Convert for compression, S3 for storage, CloudFront for delivery, and I simulated the usage of one terabyte of video. Let's see how convenient it is. So um, encoding one terabyte of video to three resolutions and a standard codec uh, is roughly 500 and a processing time of 280 hours. Yeah, you read it right, 280. You don't wanna wait for a week to get maybe, you know, that user generated content or footage compressed in the cloud. Um, actually, AWS and our providers have a solution to this that is called vertical scalability, and I'm going to cover it in the next slide, but it's still a, a, um, a lot of time uh, to just encode a one terabyte video. Um, for storage, um, this one is pretty cheap and yet not as fast as we might think, uh, but this is assuming you have a very good network, while the bottleneck here, 41 hours, uh, is is on the provider side. And finally, delivery. Um, so content delivery network on AWS costs six cents per gigabyte. Uh, if you plan to stream each video to 100, um, 100 viewers, you're gonna spend 6K. So overall, it seems like um, the, most expen ex um, the most expensive part is the delivery, um, while the most time consuming is compression. Um, these metrics, especially the times, are not encouraging if you wish to set up a video workflow exclusively in the cloud. So after all, cloud doesn't look to be so performant and convenient. But there's more to it. Um, the big issue of scalability is whether you are scaling upwards or horizontally. So um, vertical scalability um, involves data that lives on a single node and scaling is done through multi-core that is spreading the load between CPU and RAM resources on the same machine. And this is what the cloud currently offer, um, um, especially for video encoding. Uh, if you want more power, if you want those 280 hours shrink to, I don't know, maybe uh, you know a handful of hours, you need to buy more computing power on the same machine. On the other side, horizontal scaling is usually based on the partitioning of data. And it is based on adding more machines to the existing pool um, that makes you not be limited to the capacity of a single unit, making possible to scale without um, downtime. 
And um, distributed computing is also something happening in the cloud. Uh, though for uh, video encoding, it's not as adopted as we as we might want it to be. All right. So moving above the clouds, there's a solution that um, we haven't thought of uh, in, in the past decade while we were concentrated on, on the cloud, um, which is called grid computing. It was actually trending in the, in the 90s. Uh, if any of you guys uh, were alive then, you, know, you might um, remember projects like Boeing or Set It Home. And those projects gained a lot of, of attention because they leveraged the resources of everyone to tackle um, compute intensive tasks at that time were like uh, signal processing, you know, or simulation of proteins. Um, in this case, what, um, what we're doing now uh, with Byte Night is trying to uh, move this paradigm uh, forwards with the help of cloud computing and uh, applying the video processing application to this very powerful paradigm. So how does grid computing work and how can we couple it with video processing? So um, we have a video which is made of a sequence of GOPs, group of pictures, uh, which are encoded independently. And chunk-based video encoding um, makes every you know, um, group of GOPs, like uh, three or four GOPs, uh, encoded by a single device. In, in our network, we can have thousands, hundreds of thousands of devices that are available uh, all the time. And there's no limit in how much resources uh, a user can actually um, leverage while encoding a single video, while in a cloud. Remember, you have vertical scalability. You have a, a fixed set of, uh, of resources that are allocated for each job. So. Um, Mm, Chunk-based video encoding is uh, is not only um, like faster for the processing itself, but in our case, it's also faster for the upload time because we have created a system that um, streams a video and and creates these chunks on the fly and assigns them to a, a different device. So you also um, absorb all the upload time during the processing. And these devices here, um, they can be owned by any of us. So the, the, the concept, the, uh, the, the foundations of grid computing is that you don't need to uh, have purple-built purple built, um, data centers, but these devices can be owned and shared by any consumer or any business. So this can be my smartphone, this can be uh, Soyang's computer. And so far, we have proved um, faster than most of other cloud encoders. This uh, is a statistics on a test that, and a set of tests that we have performed over um, um, competitor platforms. And the number here is the uh, the number of devices that have been used for the tests. So just with twenty devices and with our um, super full tolerant algorithm, we could reach a speed of uh, almost 9x while encoding a video, which is outperforming uh, the, the average other cloud encoded provider. Um, while when we, you know, ramped up the number of devices that are in, this, in the same pool of the job, that's how we call it, like the same um, amount, the, the same set of devices that are assigned to a job, we can... Uh, we can get to like uh, uh, incredible speeds, like 30x speeds. Um, and all of this is, is done just through software technology and the availability of um, a tremendous amount of computing power, which is not that in the um, server farms, is the one that we all own, right? So today there are 12 plus billion devices that are idle eight hours a day. And they provide an enormous and exploited computing capacities, uh, several times bigger than all the capacity of the data centers uh, put together. Each user uh, on the other side, of, I mean, each uh, worker, its supplier of, of this can extract a value of $100 a month 
that's what we um, um, forecasted if you use your device 24 seven for byte nine. And there's also um, a, a very good um, incentive for environmental sustainability because ge geographically distributed computing systems allow to save 37% energy compared to serif farms. <clears throat> and we have wrapped all of this into a very nice um, SaaS platform where you can focus on your parameters and we take care of everything else. So you basically upload your video either from your computer or from um, a cloud bucket and you, you set up all your encoding parameters and your destination and, and that's it. The video um, is going to be crunched by our uh, super fast encoding system powered by our grid computing network. Um, and we have, of course, an API as well um, that you can use to um, automate your workflow and create recurring pipelines and, and tasks like watch folders. So all of this is on um, is on our website and it's no more in beta testing. We are um, using it with a few pilots. Um, yeah, so the company, maybe a word about a company before um, uh, I end this uh, talk. The company is, is very young. We started back in 2021. Um, we did just a handful of developers and uh, the aim was to bring to life uh, a new grid computing system that is general purpose. And after a while, we decided to also build an application for video encoding on top of it. That's uh, how we um, coupled the two technologies to um, to enhance this this uh, this application that we uh, think it's very um, in need of innovation. Um, and uh, in the beginning of 2023 of this year, we released this UI, uh, this SaaS platform, and um, the uh, the API with the documentation. So if you guys are interested in knowing anything more about it, uh, just shoot me an email or ask questions in the uh, in the chat, and um, I'll be glad to answer them. Thank you so much for your attention. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Fabio. Um, pretty great talk. I think I learned a lot about kind of challenges, technical challenges of video encoding. Um, yeah. And I think uh, if any of the audience had question for, for Fabio um, about binary or about, um, you know, technical challenges of encoding video format, feel free to um, uh, send them on, on the Zoom chat. Um, yeah. And also if you can, uh, Fabio, if you can share like, you know, your contact information in there as well, so people can follow up and uh, uh, reach out sure. if they're interested. Yep. Thank you. Fantastic. Yep. Yeah. So uh, for the final talk, I will I actually be the speaker and I go over um, some some stuff on multimodal um, uh, AI uh, from from a research part of view. So this could be much more applicable to us. Uh, researchers but uh but i think it's still uh, very relevant for technical builders and folks who are interested in in building um you know this kind of stuff um let me share my screen okay yeah so i got about 25 minutes so we'll probably like 20 15 20 minutes talk and then we can wrap up in the q a for all the speakers hmm. So yeah, I'm, I'm James Lee and uh, I'm currently leaving developer experience here at, at Twilight Labs and I will talk briefly about uh, multimodal uh, video understanding, uh, how it has evolved and where it is headed. So generally speaking, like it is a pretty exciting time to be involved in video AI. We have seen a uh, considerable search recently with advanced like video editing and video creation tools and that allow us to gain more insights from our media than more than ever before. Um, but these are like just scratching the surface of what could be done because there's so much more potential yet to be realized when it comes to uh, extracting engaging clips within videos or even creating new inter interactive experience based on uh, existing footage, right? So in this presentation, I will reveal how far video understanding research has come, what potential remains on top, and where it is headed in the future. So let's review uh, our history first. So it is important, you know, to highlight the difference between video perception 
and video understanding tasks. Briefly, um, uh, briefly speaking, video perception tasks involve extracting low-level features from video data, such as color, texture, and motion. On the other hand, video understanding tasks involve higher-level processing of video data, such as recognizing objects, actions, and events inside the video. And in general, uh, video perception is a prerequisite for video understanding because it provides uh, the input data necessary for higher level processing. So I'll go over a couple of the most uh, notable video perception tasks. The first one is video object detection. And this involves detecting objects in a video stream, uh, meaning that you have to analyze a sequence of frames and then identify those objects in those frames. Um, and this can be quite a complex process because the objects may move, change their size, or be partially obscured by the objects in the video. Uh, however, with some of the advanced computer vision uh, research over the past decade, you know, video object detection has become uh, much more highly effective for a wide range of application from security and surveillance to robotics and uh, AV. Uh, some of the common architecture for this include, uh, you know, a retina net, YOLO, SSD, uh, the family of RCNN model. Um, and some of the previous methods for detecting objects in video involve analyzing each image frame separately. Um, however, this approach is quite slow and inefficient because it does not consider the similarities between adjacent frames, which can lead to re um, repeated feature extraction. And as a result, uh, uh, researchers have been thinking about some of the best way to utilize you know, temporal information and aggregate features extracted from uh, different video snippet. And um, uh, most specifically speaking, they've been exploring you know, a couple of neural network solutions to exploit the consistency of video data over time. And as shown here in the figure, uh, these de detectors can be divided into um, flow base, LSTM base, attention base, uh, tracking base, and uh, a couple of other methods that uh, combine all of them together. The second perception task I want to go over is video object tracking, which estimate the trajectory of objects over time in a video sequence. And this can be important um, for a variety of fields from security and determine to spots, right? Because uh, if you can track, accurately track the movement of objects within a video, you can analyze uh, behavior patterns, detect anomalies, predict future movement, um, and many more. So there are two family approach that I want to highlight. Uh, Detection-based methods uh, first, detect the object in each frame, and then associate them across frames based on a different a different uh, criteria. And then, matching-based methods learn a similarity metric across frames and use it to match the objects based on their features. Um, so, a detection-based method tend to be more accurate, um, but they may have some limitation in terms of scalability and robustness in uh, complex scenarios. On the other hand, matching-based method may provide a more efficient and generic solution, but require ongoing refinement. The third task I want to go over is video instant segmentation. And this is quite challenging because that involves um, simultaneously detecting, segmenting, and tracking instances in a video. Um, this task often open up different possibilities for applications that require a video level object mass, such as video editing, autonomous driving, and augmented reality. So there are two main methods for doing video instant segmentation. Two-stage method, first detect objects proposals, and then use a mass head to generate instant segmentation mass. One-stage method, combine detection and segmentation in a single stage, and then use anchor-free design to improve speed and accuracy. So in order to choose the best approach for your application, you should consider the trade-offs between accuracy, speed, and memory requirements. Um, Two-stage methods may be more accurate, but slower. On the other hand, one-stage method may be faster, uh, but less accurate. So even though video perception tasks have made a lot of progress in recent years, there are still two major limitations of video perception. First one is the difficulty of defining new classes when new tasks are introduced. This is because these video perception models are often train on a fixed set of classes and therefore it can be challenging to modify the model to recognize new objects. And this can be especially problematic in dynamic environments where new objects are introduced frequently, such as in robotics or uh, autonomous vehicles. 
And you know, to address this limitation, uh, researchers has been exploring way to make this model more flexible and adaptable, such as through the, the usage of incremental learning or zero sort learning. And the second limitation of this model is their robustness when there is a domain shift. So this model often trained on a specific data set and their performance may suffer when applied to our distribution video data. And this can be especially problematic when the video content contains variation in lighting, motion, or other factors that are not well represented in the training data set. So to address this limitation, uh, people have been thinking about how to make this model more robust and generalizable, such as through domain adaptation or transfer learning capabilities. So, you know, some of the approach that I just mentioned were quite limited to some narrow tasks and had a lot of inefficiencies that resulted in like mislabeled objects or inaccurate metadata. So current approach have evolved to handle um, broader, higher level tasks like classification, search, QA, and captioning, thereby providing more opportunities for us to harness the power of video data. So video classification is the process of analyzing and categorizing video content. This involves recognizing objects, people, actions, or scenes, and, and then classifying them into predefined categories like sports or news or music or entertainment or education. And then um, broadly speaking, um, action recognition and action localization are two important research subdomains within video classification. So I wanna go over action recognition first. Um, this means you have to analyze the video frames in order to identify the title action being performed as well as when it starts and ends. And developing this kind of recognition uh, model is, is quite challenging uh, due to uh, three major um, bullet points. First, like the, the video that capturing human action tend to have both strong intra and interclass variation. What that means in layman terms is that people can perform the same action at different speed and from various viewpoints. Second, recognizing human action requires a simultaneous understanding of both short-term action-specific motion information and long-range temporal information. And therefore, you need like a sophisticated model that can handle different perspective, right? And then finally, uh, the com compute cost is very high for both uh, training and inference, which um, hinders the development and deployment of these uh, action recognition models. So uh, thanks to the availability of that scale data set and the rapid progress in deep neural networks, there's been you know, a rapid growth in this model for recognizing video action. Uh, previously, uh, convolution neural networks has been the default choice to model the video temporal information. Some examples I can go here in the slide include a deep video to stream network on the local and slow and fast. Recently, researchers have focused more on the transform-based architecture, thanks to uh, its computational efficiency to scale to even larger data, data set, right? And uh, some examples included uh, video stream transformer and uh, transformer. So the other prong of uh, video classification is action localization. And this is the task of classifying what action is being performed in a sequence of video frames and then localizing each action in both space and time. So the localization can be visualized using bounding boxes or masks. So this task, you know, fetch the usual challenges as seen in action recognition. However, there is an additional set of challenges like background clutter or object occlusion in the video, uh, linking actions between frames in the presence of irregular camera motion and predicting the optical, optical flow for, of the action. And so uh, there are a couple of methods here and there used to uh, address like, the, this task you know, in video. Most of them actually um, you know, leverage the usage of similar features like RGB pixel values, optical flow, and a skeleton graph. So that, that is all you know, that I got to say about video classification, you know, quite comprehensive. The second um, task I want to talk about is video to text retrieval, uh, aka video search. And this task aims to find the most relevant video related to the semantics in a given sentence and, and vice versa. So 
This requires uh, the analysis of content within a large number of video to text pairs in order to fully uh, extrapolate the multimodal information being involved and judge whether these two modalities can be aligned. So, you know, given the explosive growth of multimedia information, you can imagine that this task is quite powerful to help people quickly search for an item that meets their needs, right? So in general, the video to text retrieval task can be divided into four components, um, video representation extraction, textual representation extraction, feature embeddings and matching, and then uh, designing the objective function for final ranking. You can see here on the um, bottom right of the slide. Um, so even though you know this task has a lot of progress in recent years, there's still some inherent challenges with, with designing an effective video to search um, uh, methods, right? Like how to extract complete and robust video features, how to address the cross-model gap between video and text retrievals, as well as how to reduce the training time and retrieval absences of this model. The third uh, understanding task I want to go over is called video QA, video question answering. And the goal here is to predict the right answers based on a question and a video, right? And video QA has become more and more popular thanks to research in vision language understanding. And the promise here is to develop AI agents that can communicate using natural language with the dynamic visual world. So um, at a high level, video QA can be mainly divided into two types. There's multiple choice QA, and then there's open-handed QA. So for multiple choice QA, uh, the model are given several candidate answers for each question, and then it had it must select select the correct answer. For open-ended QA, uh, the problem can be uh, you know classification, meaning like you know classify the answer into like a certain correct uh, class. It can be generation where you know the model generate the word by word answer, or like even regression where uh, the model predict the next word in the vocabulary, um, you know, uh, sorry, uh, the compute the integer value answer that, that is close to the correct truth answer. Um, and, and there's, you know, four major components in a common framework for video QA, um, a video encoder, a question encoder, um, the cross model interaction component to type this encoder output uh, together, and finally an answer decoder to uh, spit out the output for the end user. So compared to some of the other video tasks, uh, QA requires a complete understanding of the video at different levels of granularity, right? So various techniques have been proposed in recent years, but most notably the, the transform-based architecture you now demonstrate very powerful capabilities for fine-grained video reasoning while requiring fewer computational resources and provide uh, providing better interpretability. And, and the three examples I put here on the slide uh, demonstrate those uh, valid, malot, and just us uh, three system. Yeah, so that's video QA in a nutshell. The final um, understanding task I want to talk about is video captioning. This is the process of uh, describing the content of a video sequence in order to capture the semantic relationships and the meaning of it. So the number of applications that could ben be beneficial with this technology is enormous. Like you can think of content retrieval system, smart video surveillance, and computer human in interface system, right? Just to name a few. So um, the figure I show here on the slide provides a general overview uh, of a typical solution for a video captioning task, which is an encoder decoder framework. So you have the a visual encoder that extract video features, put it to the encoder, uh, which the, the language, you know, um, and um, encoder translated into a text format in order to generate the uh, final uh, description. Um, and a rule of thumb is that, like you know, to improve those uh, captions created by the AI, it is very crucial to include the human knowledge in it. So when a model can learn from different source, different mod modalities, right, like video, audio, and subtitle, it can better understand and explain what is happening, leading to better captions overall. So. While the early methods uh, rely on the standard encoder decoder framework, um, again, you know, the rise of the transformer architecture has brought great innovation to recent video captioning techniques. And I put here some examples of uh, architecture that use different variants of transformer, you know, from bidirectional to mass transformer to a vision transformer. So 
So um, let's uh, quickly go over the, the future section um, and see like what's the future gonna have for, for, for you know, um, video understanding research, right? So foundation model is a concept has been become very popular lately, uh, given its application in NLP and computer vision, but the potential its application for video, I think it's, it's not been fully realized yet. And one area of research that shows promise for improving good understanding is the development of hybrid models that can combine the strengths of different modalities, right? Uh, and these multi-model audition models can leverage, you know, techniques like unsupervised and self-supervised learning to extract the features from different modalities and create a more holistic understanding of the video content. So I wanna briefly go over like just, just a few example of what these multi-model video foundation models look like. Um, the samples on, on the left side is a system called Merlot Reserve, and it can learn multi-model neural script knowledge representation of the video by jolly reasoning over video frames, text, and audio. This model is trained on over 20 million YouTube videos through a, a contrastive mass band learning objective to learn from text and audio self supervision. And the one on the right side is called Video Coca, which um, leverage existing contrastive captioners without requiring fine tuning. So the model use a, a system called Coca uh, to generate uh, the candidate sentences, which are then scored by a transformer based model. And the model then is trained to score the candidate sentence based on the relevance to the target video. So this, this solution is super cool for video captioning in general. So the one on the left side is called vid to sec which is a sing single stage dense video captioning model that has been pre-trained on narrative video. It takes you know, the frames and the transcribed speech from an untrained video that is several minutes long as the input. And then it output the dense event caption together with the temporal localization in the video by putting a single sequence of tokens. The one on the right side is a new tool called Track Anything, which is designed for video object tracking and segmentation. And this, this tool is developed upon the, uh, uh, the SAM model, which is short for segment anything model. And it can specify anything to track and segment via user clicks only. So uh, during tracking, the users can flexibly change the object they want to track or correct the region of interest if there are any ambiguity. So it's super you know, suitable for tracking segmentation with like very quick um, short change, right? It also be useful for downstream tasks like video in painting and video editing. So brief summary of what I talked about today. In the past, video understanding research was limited to low level uh, perception tasks like object detection, segmentation, and tracking. And then uh, present approach can handle higher level understanding tasks like classification, search, QA, and captioning. And uh, in the future, uh, you know, we uh, have very strong conviction in multimodal video audition models that can perform, you know, like basically like a Socratic model that can understand a lot of things and do different things. Um, uh, so a quick, quick note about Tor Labs. We are, you know, uh, developing foundation models for multimodal video understanding. And our goal is to help developers build programs that can see, listen, and understand the world as we do with the most advanced view and understanding infrastructure. Uh, and if you would love to learn more, um, this is the, our, our Discord uh, QR code that you can join to chat about all things about tomorrow, yeah, and you know, we actually found the two speakers, Ryan and, and Fabio, both of them are uh, community members. Um, yeah, and uh, I actually also wrote a whole blog post about what I talk about here. Uh, in the presentation, so you can, you know, uh, read that that piece to get a more detailed understanding. Uh, if you want to, you know, get collect the the literature that I cover in the presentation. Uh, so yeah, uh, appreciate your um, your listening. All right. Um, so it's two twenty seven, and we have like a couple of minutes left. Does anyone want to uh, ask question or want to keep uh, high level, um, um, I guess like shameless promotion if they're working on an interesting project?
Oh, on, on final note about kind of the format. Of, James, of, uh, I'll just James, I'll just ask a question of the of the um, of the presentations. You know, was there something that you found particularly interesting, or um, <clears throat> just something that you you thought was interesting to see during the presentation? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think like. Um, um, yeah, I, I think one, one thing that I keep like uh, double click on throughout the whole presentation is is the uh, versatility of the transformer architecture, right? Like this this model, this architecture is really designed for um, for language, but it has it, it has it has permeate uh, uh, the the image world, the vision world, now and then go to the video world, and so uh, the implication of that is like you know if we build models, build build new architecture approach. In the future, you can you can only just like you know choose that that model as the backbone, without having to think too much, uh, right on the algorithm side, and therefore you can focus more on some of the other important part like compute or engineering, right or the end user experience. Like you can focus on like video encoding stuff, right? Just like what Fabio talked talk to us about. You can focus on like the the user experience of search, just like what Ryan talked about, right? So I think. Uh, the the that that versatility really democratized the development of these algorithms and allow us to uh, bring go go deeper into the engineer with the engineering and the the UX part of, of building this application. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it's quick note on the logistics. So we have this uh, webinars weekly and. Uh, we try to do a combination of uh, you know speakers and tutorials. So uh, definitely always in the lookout for for speakers. So if you like um, a, a startup founder, uh, a, a, an engineer who building interesting projects, or like a researchers doing in doing research in multimodal AI, you, and you want to share like kind of your work uh, to, to the community, feel free to reach out to me and other people in the Tool Labs team. Um, yeah, and then we can um, um, loop you in, you know, into one of the future video, uh, future webinar session to 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 help you talk about your your great projects. Um, yeah, and is there anything else I'm missing? Yeah, are uh, we still doing Q and A? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh no, please go ahead. I had a question oh, for okay. Ryan. <laughs> Sorry, I have one more question. How many usually like, is there a number of cameras that are being like using concurrently for being used concurrently for different angles for like the unscripted filming? Yeah, it it, hi, it definitely varies. Um, the Amazing Race is the show I'm working on currently, and there's basically ten teams. It starts out with ten teams. There's ten cameras following those teams, so that's ten times. So however many hours of footage, I mean, typically they'll shoot maybe six, seven hours a day. So there's always those cameras running on those teams. And then there's uh, cameras in, there's called zone cameras. So there's additional cameras plus GoPros, plus, you know, anything else that they have in the mix. That's a widespread, you know, not necessarily controlled environment. You get into the controlled environments like Master Chef and Top Chef, and there's, you know, six cameras running or, or as, again, as many as sort of, with GoPros and everything. So um, the technology is allowed for a lot of cameras to run simultaneously, and they, they definitely utilize that to capture the moments uh, within that unscripted realm for sure. Gotcha, thank you. Oh, I had I'd spoken earlier. I was just, I messaged James separately as well. I was also, I love hearing everyone's kind of presentations these are all really 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 focused and and in depth and i didn't expect to get such a interesting conversation out of it i'm so happy i joined um i would also like to present sometime next week or whenever i get a slot but uh this sounds like a, this is such a cool community i'm really glad i met you guys let's do it hey, thanks very much <laughs> it'd be awesome to have you on awesome um any other last questions uh, that you want to ask uh, for the presenters today. Can, can I ask a question to James? Yeah. I, 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 I have a lot of, there's a, a lot of the um, 
like what you, what you said is sort of you know very advanced for, in, for me. I'm not a uh, I'm not a data engineer or anything like that. So it's, I'm coming at it so at this like very green perspective. But I see terms like uh, video Q and A. And in terms of like from uh, like say my perspective, how would video Q and A be something that would be beneficial? I, I, you know, can you see it relating to video editing in that sense? Um, you know, like I, and, and I'll say this as a um, you know, I, I see dem, you know demonstrations of Q and A for language and uh, you know helping to sort of maybe maybe for Shopify and like helping to sort of identify uh, product. You know, you can chat with them with the with a uh, a model or the with the Shopify model. But how does how would you see that in um, video Q and A applied to say video or if, if it is. Oh, so your question is about the or to editing, sorry. Yeah, implication of video QA development to video editing um, mm -hmm. um, process, right? Yes, yeah, please. I think um, so. I think the biggest benefit of it is like you know, um, um, you can you can you can um, you can you can communicate. Uh, with the video using natural language, right? So just like a, a similar uh, methodology is like how you like use the, the, the GPT for OpenAI where you can, you know, chat with it understanding something for your task like like document summarization, for instance. Uh, you can you can do the same, but but you know, the, the, the input here is the video. So you imagine you, you can like uh, quickly summarize your, your video, uh, asking it, hey, um, can you, um, Give me a quick sentences um, or like a few sentences, right? Uh, what this video is about. That could be very useful um, for you to understanding what to edit, right? Or you can like say, ask, ask like, you, you got this edit and then you ask like, you know, what's happening between, you know, minute second and minute four, right? And quickly get that information. Uh, so like for, for the fun of video editing, you can, you can leverage the textual description and then uh, uh, use it somehow. Yeah. Um, Jerry wants to say that. Yeah. And I think, you know, the underlying technology that powers captioning and, and visual question, question answering, um, can be tweaked a little bit to have like a chat experience when you're editing videos. Right. So if you are, um, looking to edit specific scenes, let's say like, I mean, you might be wondering, like, how many bullets did Neo dodge, like, on, like, in the first Matrix movie? Like, you'll be able to count, and you'd be able to, like, identify. You can, like, ask it questions, like, maybe, like, some some bullets, should we, like, you can ask it to, like, blur it out, right? So it's it's basically the, it's marrying, like, a language model as a reasoning engine, and then having having a powerful video model as, like, a visual cortex, and and be able to, uh, interact with your video data, which would be really powerful uh, for video editing, I assume. But a lot of the use cases that that, that Twelve Labs have been hearing are coming from like patient monitoring and, and things like that, right? Did Elizabeth have her dinner, or did she like fall down, or if if she did, like write me a description of what happened, mm -hmm. things like that, right? Yeah, that, that's very cool. Thank you very much for the answer. And uh, yeah, it, 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 something that's definitely like, for me, this is all very mind blowing. So it's uh, super fun to explore, uh, especially when, you know, in, in editing, we, we always say we're not saving lives, but you know, you guys are actually, you know, with that description that you just said about patient monitoring could be saving lives, which is pretty cool. So uh, thanks for that. I'll have to admit when I see QA like that, my mind immediately goes to quality assurance. And that's why all my responses are about <laughs> videos and programming passing quality assurance of which 12 labs certainly can play in that space too. So. Definitely. So, awesome. I think, yeah. Then we run um, some minutes over time. So we'd love to um, or yeah, get, get to you back, you know, to focus on the rest of the day, but thanks for turning in and uh, the, the, um, this, this, there's a recording is also available afterwards on YouTube and we'll, we'll be sure to uh, distribute it to, to all the email um, with, of the attendees. And yeah, don't forget to um, join our Discord community, um, you know, to, to learn more about multimodal AI and uh, reach out to us if you have uh, 
talks, folks, um, projects that you want to share and then anything else that you think could be beneficial. Uh, yeah, would appreciate any uh, valuable feedback. Awesome, folks. Great meeting Thanks, you all. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Bye. Thank yeah, thanks for having me. Too. Thank you, Fabio. Thanks so much, Ryan. Yeah, thanks. Talk to you soon.